Well, welcome everyone to Dinner Church. Come to the table. But you are coming to the table from your homes because we want to keep everyone safe and uh, bless everyone. Happy Easter, everyone. Happy Resurrection Sunday. I wish so much that we could be together on this day. I wish that we could all be gathered together, but it's just not possible. This is originally the day that we were going to relaunch morning worship at the Owasso Citadel, but it just wasn't meant to be. Not right now, but the future is bright, everyone. And I'm just so excited to be here today. And indeed, he is risen. And the correct response traditionally to that phrase is, he is risen indeed. So I will say it to you and everyone at your homes, would you just respond to me? I say, he is risen. Yes, he is risen indeed. And I hope you're declaring that right now in your own home. He is risen indeed. So t today we're talking about the resurrection, the, the fact that Jesus Christ is alive. Perhaps the most important question of the entire Bible is the question of Jesus's death burial and resurrection to put it plainly the question is did jesus rise from the dead if jesus was crucified and he died and was placed in a tomb and he simply stayed dead then christianity is nothing but if jesus was crucified buried but after three days he physically resurrected from the dead then jesus really was god on earth and everything he said and everything he did then matters infinitely. Verified historical sources tell us that Jesus was a real person who was born in Bethlehem and he later grew up in Galilee. Historians also tell us that Jesus spoke and lived and was crucified under the Romans, probably around the age of 30 to 33. History also records that Jesus died and was placed in a particular tomb, the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea. History also tells us that the tomb was found to be empty. We will examine briefly um, the fact of the empty tomb and how to explain it historically. We will uh, th then talk about how we ought to respond to that sa saga in our personal lives. Uh, Jesus himself is mentioned as a historical person in multiple sources. Uh, from the ancient world such as Tacitus, Pliny the Younger, Josephus, the Babylonian Talmud, and Lucian, among, among many others. So these are all sources outside the Bible where Jesus is specifically talked about. But it's interesting, the, 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 uh, the New Testament scriptures are themselves more historically attested to than any of these sources. Any of those sources we just mentioned, the New Testament has... Uh, more uh, manuscript copies than any of them all combined. There are 5,868 ancient Greek manuscript copies of the New Testament. The accuracy of these manuscripts when compared to one another are 99.5% accurate. The only differences between these manuscripts are minor spelling and grammar errors that don't impact the meaning substantially. So therefore, I would make the contention that as is the general consensus in history, the New Testament documents are historically reliable and outside historical sources prove beyond reasonable doubt that Jesus of Nazareth did exist, was crucified, and his tomb was found to be empty. Jesus did exist, he was crucified, and his tomb was found to be empty. Those three facts are beyond dispute, historically speaking. Those are actual, real facts that are um, universally accepted within the historical community. So we get to the real question though. Did Jesus rise from the dead? The tomb was empty. That much is historically known. So how did historians explain the empty tomb? The most direct explanation would be that Jesus did in fact rise from the dead. Christianity spread quickly after the crucifixion. In fact, each of Jesus' disciples, aside from John, were martyred for their faith. That means they were, they were killed for their faith. History records that each of them died proclaiming that Jesus had risen from the dead. Let me repeat that. Each of them died proclaiming that Jesus had risen from the dead. 
Why would they die for something that wasn't true? Let me ask you that question. If it wasn't true, if they made it up, if they stole the body from the tomb, if they never really saw Jesus, would each of them be willing to die for a lie? I don't think so. In fact, there are historically uh, historical records and events in which Jesus appears to people after his own death. That's recorded throughout the New Testament, including at one point where he appeared to over 500 people. And that's from uh, 1 Corinthians 15. The best answer is that Jesus really did rise from the dead. Let's go into some further details on evidence. Once again, we can mention how Christianity spread rapidly from Jerusalem and into the ancient Roman Empire, being preached by the same disciples who fled into hiding after Jesus was crucified. If you remember the, the night that Jesus was betrayed and crucified, all the disciples except for one fled and hid in fear of the Romans. And there was only one disciple who stayed with Jesus, it was John. So... It's interesting that these same terrified disciples who were hiding would suddenly become bold as lions to travel as missionaries across the ancient world when they encountered the resurrected Jesus. The example of the Apostle Paul is also telling. He encountered the resurrected Jesus on the Damascus Road, if you, if you recall, and he went, went from being a persecutor of the early church, he was hunting them down and, and having them arrested, to one of the heroes of the early church. It says that Jesus appeared to over 500 witnesses, and it was recorded by the Apostle Paul that while he was writing this letter to the Corinthians, one we just referenced, he, he, told, he told these people in this letter, many of these people are still alive, the 500 who saw Jesus. He is in effect inviting readers to go and ask these eyewitnesses about whether they saw Jesus. So he's saying, look, these people who saw Jesus resurrected from the dead after he was crucified, they're still alive. Go talk to them and ask them what they saw, okay? Imagine that. Some of them had passed away, but a lot of them were still alive. Now, Jesus, of course, also showed himself to his disciples on the Emmaus Road, if you remember that account, uh, also along the Sea of Galilee, and also to James specifically after his crucifixion. If you remember, James said, I will not believe. He was, he, he was stubborn. He's a lot like us today. He's like, I will not believe unless I put my finger into the holes in his hands and feet. And I, I, I got to put my hand in his side where he was speared, okay? Or I won't believe. He was a skeptic. And who did Jesus walk up to? James. He came to James. The resurrected Jesus came to James and said, here I am, dude. Put your hand in the holes in my hands, Put your hand into my side. Stop doubting and believe already. And I'm sure he's saying a lot, something very similar to us today. Stop doubting and believe. Given the spread of Christianity from a few thousand persecuted Jewish Christians to being the most prominent religion in the world today, the empirical and historical evidence is strong that Jesus did, in fact, resurrect from the dead. Additionally, millions of people today testify, me included, to the fact that Jesus has changed their lives. This all forms a cumulative case that we can indeed believe that Jesus Christ rose from the dead. There is much evidence to believe historically that the tomb was empty and that Jesus did rise from the dead. So I know Someone rising from the dead, we, we think we don't see that in real life. We don't see people who literally die who then get back up. So how, how can that be scientifically true? And I, I know a lot of people are very scientifically minded. They, this, is, this is a miracle. This is the miraculous. Yes, we do see the miraculous in our world. Every day when people pray and people get healed, we see uh, just uh, incredible miracles that couldn't have come about by chance. But, but I think the greatest evidence of... Can God raise Jesus from the dead like that? Um, think about this. We know that the universe had a beginning, right? The universe began to exist, something that scientists call the Big Bang. We as Christians call it in the beginning, God said. God spoke the universe into existence. So if God can make all that we see around us, all the trees, the sky, the galaxies, the, the stars, the, the moons, the, the planets, 
is it really that hard for God to raise Jesus from the dead? God made the universe. He can do anything he wants within the universe he created, right? So is it really that hard to believe Jesus rose from the dead? So given this cumulative case, we talk about history. We talk about science. You can also talk about archaeology, how people will use the Bible to find and unearth cities and unearth all these archaeological artifacts that in, in, indeed confirm the biblical uh, historical uh, timeline. So I, I have an entire study Bible called the Archaeological Study Bible that's filled with thousands of archaeological discoveries that confirm the Bible, that confirm the Bible. I'll give you just one example. If you recall that uh, Jesus, when he was born, that there was a census declared by Augustus. And they actually found a statue of Augustus in the Red Sea. They, they found it there, they pulled it out, there it is. And it's, it's, it's Augustus, it says Augustus on it. So it's, there's thousands of discoveries like that. So historically, scientifically, archeologically, we have this cumulative case that Jesus is alive and he is risen. And I hope you're thinking in your head, he is risen indeed. Say it out loud. He is risen indeed. Speak it. Declare it because you know it's true. Jesus is alive. Jesus is speaking through me right now. He's speaking through, uh, oh my goodness, hundreds of thousands of pastors around the world who are all preaching about Jesus is alive in thousands and tens of thousands of churches across the whole planet. Everyone, all these ministers are declaring Jesus is alive because why? Because it's an old tradition? No, because it's true. I know I know my generation, millennials, young people, we, we've been sold this fake bill of goods that it's, oh, it's just a book of myths. It's like Greek gods. That's not even true. That's false. All these other fa false religions, like, like the Greek myth mysticisms, there's no historical backing for those things. There's, there's no evidence that those people existed. There is evidence that Jesus existed, tons of it. So when you really dig into it, you realize wait a minute, these aren't, these don't read like myths. They read like history. And you realize that when you read through the Bible, it's referring to real places. Israel, Jerusalem, these are real places today. It's referring to re real empires like, uh, like the Persians, like uh, Babylon, like the Roman Empire. These, these are real people, real places, real historical events. So that, that is what's different. And, and my, my generation was sold a false bill of goods by the media, by the news media, by, by the, uh, the academic institutions that faith in Jesus and Christianity are, are just mythical. And, and that's a lie. I've, I've studied it and I've realized that is a huge lie. I was sold a bill of goods and I know the truth now that Jesus is alive. So you can believe. Therefore, this is our, our big transition now. We know that Jesus is alive, right? Therefore, how should we live? If Jesus is alive right now, you can look up at the sky, you can look around you. Jesus is alive, Jesus is with you. How should we live? How should we live in response to the fact that Jesus is God and Jesus is alive? Well, to, to that, I'll point you to the book of Colossians, chapter 3, verses 14 through 17. It says, put on love. Three words, put on love. That's the start. Love which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body. That's the body of Christ, the church. And it says, be thankful. I've found in life, you guys, we have to uh, develop an attitude of gratitude. That is the secret to happiness in life, having an attitude of gratitude. It continues, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom and spiritual songs, singing songs and hymns with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do in word and deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. That's beautiful. Because Jesus Christ is real, we should put on love. It says love binds everything together. Love binds the universe together. Why is this reminding me of Star Wars? Um, I think Obi-Wan Kenobi talking to Luke. It binds the galaxy together. He's talking about the force. All right, I'm gonna stop nerding out. It unifies everything. And we are called to be part of the body of Christ, 
which is the church, unified, at peace. And we ought to be thankful. Because Jesus is here right now, I mean, he could be standing right behind me. I can't see him, but he's real. He's living in me. He's alive in heaven. He's also active right now in the world. Because Jesus is here, and he's, with, he's here with me on this live stream, he's here with you in your, in, in, your, in your house. He's there with you right now. Think about that. You should live out an attitude of gratitude because of that. What are you thankful for today? I want to ask you, I want to challenge you that during this crisis, during this COVID-19 uh, hysteria, what are you thankful for today? I'm thankful for a warm house to, to live in. I'm thankful for safety from those who would persecute us. I'm thankful for my friends and family. I'm, thank you for, I'm thankful for Jesus. I'm thankful for the church. I'm thankful for each of you. What are you thankful for today? I want you to be thinking about what you're thankful for. It's easy to get negative and pessimistic and start saying, oh, uh, I deserve better. Getting this attitude of entitlement, like I deserve more. That's, a, that's, a, that's an ugly road, guys. Stay on the road of I'm thankful. Look at all that I have. Look, look at how blessed I am. My cup overflows. Let's continue in Ze Zephaniah 3, verse 17. It says, the Lord your God is in your midst. That's just what we were talking about. The Lord your God is in your midst. He's right here. He's a mighty one who will save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you by his love. He will exalt over you with loud singing. Isn't it wonderful to know, totally know, that God is with all of us right at this moment? He's always with us. He is not limited by space or time, guys. He can be with all of you personally and with me at the same time. He's here in the United States, in Michigan, in Owasso, at 302 East Exchange Street, where I'm at, he's right here with me. Yet he is also with a Christian being persecuted in prison in China right now. On the other side of the world, he's with that persecuted Chinese Christian right now as well. And I want you guys to remember, with you, with you he has all the time in the world. He's not, he's not rushing off to deal with something else. He's not always busy. He's, he's patiently right there with you. You've got God's full attention right now. Does he have your full attention though, I wonder? Or are you d doing five different th things at the same time? Sometimes we do that, don't we? Slow down, focus on God. So in response, uh, I want you guys to focus on God because he's patiently and attentively ministering to your heart, your mind, your intellect, and your very soul, your emotions, who you really are. And he's building you up. I want you to just think about, just, just receive this right now, okay? God rejoices over us with gladness. That's in the word of God. That's true. God rejoices over you with gladness. He's rejoicing over you. He loves you. It also says, God quiets us with his love. Sometimes we're upset. We're in tears. We're crying out. God gently quiets us with his love. He quiets you with his love. And thirdly, God exalts us with singing. I just picture God just loving us so much and, and, and exalting us, honoring us, and, and just singing out praises over us because he, he's pleased in those who serve him. Isn't that amazing? He exalts us with singing. That's beautiful. Another scripture, 1 Chronicles 16.29 Here's how we should respond to the fact that God is with us. It says, ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. What does that mean? I always, I, I see that word glory and I wonder, what does it mean to ascribe to the Lord glory? I, I think what it means is to regard the, the, the Lord as perfect and holy and good. Just be in, in awe of God, like, wow, you know? You ever just look up the stars and you're like, wow. You look at the moon, you're like, wow. You look at like a a deer or like a, some sort of wildlife and you're like, wow, look at how amazing it is. Look at how intricate it is. You look at like mountains or out at the ocean, you're thinking, wow, you know, wow. Or you, you look at your husband or wife and think, wow, that person loves me, you know. Um, it's beautiful. That's what God has made. And these things are just reflections of the much greater glory of our God. So in the same way as you, you, you think, wow, amazing, you revere your 
you're just stunned, you're breathless, also be breathless toward God, be wow toward God, be in awe of God, ascribe, that's what it means to ascribe glory to God, that God is glorious, beautiful, majestic, amazing. It says, bring an offering and come before him. So we should bring an offering, we give our tithes and offerings, we, we give a sacrifice of our time, of our talents, of our gifts, and we also come before him. Some of you guys are neglecting this, and I'm calling you out right now. Spend real time with God. You leave your TV on, you leave your internet, you're playing your, with, with your phone, but you're not spending time with God. you got to spend time with God. It says, come before him. And then it says, worship the Lord in the splendor of holiness. And that's a beautiful thing to worship God and see him as holy, as perfect, as perfect justice, as perfect love. You, you regard God as holy, as perfect, you might say. So we have to respond to the fact that we know Jesus is alive, we've looked at the case for that, therefore our response is worship. Not because we're supposed to, not because we feel compelled to, like you have to, um, but because we want to. I remember uh, one of my secession mates at training college at seminary, um, sometimes I would complain, I'm in, oh, we got to do this now, and Karen would always turn to me and say, we get to do this, Justin. I think, man, she's right. We do get to do this, don't we? And that's the right attitude. We get to do this. We get, get to do these things. We get to love God. It's a great blessing. So whenever I pray, you guys, for a half hour, or I read the Bible for a while in bed at night, or I attend Bible study, or go to church, all of that builds my interest and my focus on God. See, as a result of the way I've been living, I've sown good seeds in my life for the most part. It's like we all have a garden in our heart, you guys, and we wanna sow good seeds into it. Whenever we um, come to church or come to Bible study, we pray for a good amount of time, we, we, um, we study the word, we, we just praise God, we sing songs to God. As we live that way, we're planting seeds in, our, in the garden of our heart. And then as those seeds grow up, we're, we're watering them. We're, we're watering them by continuing to do those things. And that is producing a harvest in us. And, and it grows up, it grows up, it grows up, and then it's harvested. It's this incredible, um, we build this pattern in our lives of living rightly, and we see ourselves being changed from within. We've planted a, a garden of righteousness in our souls, and it has grown up. But indeed, God is the one who's do, doing the planting, but we're just responding to what he's doing, right? So I, I challenge you guys because it can also be that we're planting weeds. Because whenever we fall back into sin, we're planting a weed in that garden. And it's it's going to choke out the good fruit, and, it, and it's going to damage that garden and hurt that garden. And that, that's why we see people who fall away after a while, who who depart from the church, who go, go back to the ways of the world. They they are they are not planting good seeds, they're planting bad seeds in, in the in their hearts. So we want to be planting good seeds in our hearts, right? And we do that through worship, through living this lifestyle of worship. So that is the lifestyle we're called to. My point here is that Jesus Christ is the one who does this though, okay? He does the impossible in us. Our hearts were once like stone, you know, and, and now we have soft new hearts that God has given us. And we're planting in them whenever we do good, good things. We're planting uh, good fruit in there. Um, and every time we worship God, we are planting um, in that. Our, our worship is not simply singing or praising or even prostrating before him. Our worship is much more than that, you guys. It is a daily song, and it's sung by acts of worship. When, when, whenever you volunteer at a food pantry, you sing before God. When you share the gospel with a friend, you sing before God. When you play with your kids, you sing before God. When you give food to a homeless man, you sing before God. When you smile at a stranger, when they look sad, you sing before God. When you give someone a hug, you sing before God. When you share a Bible verse, you sing before God. When you help those in need, you sing before God. It's all a daily, weekly, monthly, yearly song that we are always singing toward our Creator, this lifestyle of worship that we're living day in and day out. Psalm 147.1 says, Praise the Lord, for it is good to sing praises to our God. <clears throat> For it is pleasant, and a song of praise is fitting. 
So guys, in conclusion today, as we delight in this Resurrection Sunday, He is risen. Let's remember to have an attitude of daily worship, to sing that song of praise in our conduct, in our lifestyle. Recall what Jesus Christ did on the cross for you, how he died for your sins to remove your sins, the things you've committed that are evil. And believe and know that he rose from death by the power of God and that Jesus now sits alive and well at the right hand of God the Father. And I'll leave you today with this powerful description of the life of Jesus Christ. To close out today, to just receive this, all right? It's from James Stewart, who was a Scottish theologian. It says, Jesus was the meekest and lowliest of all the sons of men. Yet he spoke of coming on the clouds of heaven with the glory of God. He was so austere that evil spirits and demons cried out in terror at his coming. Yet he was so genial and winsome and approachable that the children loved to play with him and the little ones nestled in his arms. His presence at the innocent joy of a village wedding was like the presence of sunshine. No one was half so kind or compassionate to sinners, yet no one ever spoke such red hot scorching words about sin. A bruised reed he would not break, his whole life was love. Yet on one occasion, he demanded of the Pharisees how they were expected to escape the damnation of hell. He was a dreamer of dreams and a seer of visions. Yet for sheer stark realism, he has all of us self-styled realists soundly beaten. He was the servant of all, washing the disciples' feet. Yet masterfully, he strode into the temple and the hucksters and money changers fell over one another to get away in their mad rush from the fire they saw blazing in his eyes. He saved others, yet at the last, he himself, he did not save. There is nothing in history like the union of contrasts which confronts us in the gospels. The mystery of Jesus is the mystery of divine personality. Everybody, Jesus Christ is risen. He is alive. He is a living Savior. He lives in heaven physically, yet he is also alive in me and in you. Jesus Christ is Lord. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, God Almighty, we praise you. We sing your praises. We worship you in response to the fact, God, that you raised Jesus from the dead, and we have a living Savior, a living God who is active in our lives. God Almighty, we worship you. We worship you with our voice, with our deeds. We worship you with all we have, God, because you are worthy of praise. We love you, Lord. We give our lives to you, God. You are holy, holy, holy. Lord, we play Pray a blessing over this city, over the city of Owasso. God, may your gospel spread throughout this community. May people know that Jesus Christ is risen and is alive. God, help us to follow you with our whole hearts every day as we live a lifestyle of worship. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in. Resurrection Sunday.